Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world, and welcome to today's DevOps.com program, brought to you by TechStrong and Fairwinds. My name is Cody J. Brown. I'm the host of TechStrong Learning, and we have an exciting program for you today. First, I do have just a couple of housekeeping notes. So today's session is being recorded. If you miss any of our webinar, or you'd like to watch it later or share with a friend, the on-demand recording will be made available shortly after we conclude our live session today. If you have any question for Kindle and the team, we want you to send those in to us using the Q&A tab, which you, you'll find on the right side of your screen. That's also where you're gonna find the chat tab, and that's where we want you to get to know the rest of your audience members. Um, let us know where you're from or any comments you might have throughout today's program. And I will also point out that we do have two polls we'll be launching throughout today's program, and we, we really want your participation there. Finally, before we close, well, we will be giving away four $25 Amazon gift cards, so be sure to stick around until the very end. Our topic today is why Kubernetes is the black hole of FinOps, and I'm joined by Kendall Miller, techn technical evangelist at Fairwinds, Robert Brennan, vice president of product development at Fairwinds, and Rachel Sweeney, insights enablement engineer at Fairwinds. So Rachel, Robert, Kendall, thank you all so much for joining me today. I'm going to let Kendall take it from here. All right. Thanks, Cody. And uh, we will go ahead and dive in. Welcome, folks. This is why Kubernetes is the black hole of FinOps. And uh, excited to have you here. We're going to be talking about what is different about Kubernetes in the FinOps world. Uh, that's what the point of this talk is. Why Kubernetes specifically is a black hole when it comes to cost and finops -y things. Um, what's difficult about understanding it. What you can do to... Um, to get around that and uh, we'll go ahead and dive in. So I'm on a little bit different setup than I'm used to today. So pardon me as I jump things around, but hopefully it's uh, not real obvious to most of y'all. Um, let's start with introductions. Robert, you wanna go first? Yeah, hey folks, my name is Robert Brennan. I'm VP of product development here at Fairwinds. Uh, I lead up all the engineering efforts around insights. Um, so I can hopefully give you all a little bit more uh, insight into how we think about costs and Kubernetes. Great, and Rachel? Yeah, thank you, Kendall. Um, hey, everyone, my name is Rachel Sweeney. I am the Insights Enablement Engineer here at Fairwinds. I coming from a background of being a DevOps engineer and then a site reliability engineer before that. So digging into a lot of the technical weeds of insights and getting it to work in all different kinds of environments and yeah. All right, and hey folks, my name's Kendall Miller. Uh, I've been at Fairwinds for seven years now and uh, kind of done just about everything. Today I am a technical evangelist uh, and excited to be here and talk with you about uh, what we're doing at Fairwinds. So um, real quick, well, about, about Kubernetes, about FinOps and what we're doing at Fairwinds, I, I should specify. Um, why we're talking to you today, so real quick, Fairwinds is uh, the trusted partner for Kubernetes security, policy, and governance. It's our mission to help companies ship faster uh, with more confidence so that uh, it costs them less, that there's less risk involved, and um, we build software that unifies problems in dev, security, and operations uh, so we can remove friction from between those two. Um, that's the that's the the mission statement. Um, the bigger picture is we've been working in Kubernetes for a very long time. We have built and maintained Kubernetes infrastructure for lots and lots of companies over the years. And when we were doing much more services a while back, today we're heavily focused on software. And um, we build software to give people confidence that they're using Kubernetes right. Kubernetes is still a new paradigm for most places. Uh, so we have built a bunch of open source as well as a SaaS platform that marries together our open source and some other folks, as well as some other proprietary bits to give people confidence in using Kubernetes. When you make this switch, you want to not have to learn all of the painful lessons of a new paradigm the hard way. So check out our open source on GitHub. We're going to show you a little bit of our software towards the end of this. It's relevant uh, across security, reliability, and then cost efficiency, which is part of what we're talking about today. So we have built a bunch of logic into some of our software around uh, FinOps and, and managing cost and understanding cost. And uh, that's why we're here talking about this today. It's something we care about. Um, and uh, yeah, so let's start though with a polling question. Where are you in your Kubernetes journey? Um, and we'll pull that up. Are you just learning about containers and Kubernetes? <clears throat> are you planning to use it in the next six to 12 months? 
or are you already using it in production? And uh, you can fill that out. We'll give it a few seconds here. I'm going to know that. our audience is. I need that Go elevator ahead. music at this point. Maybe some Jeopardy theme song. <laughs> or Kindle. Yeah, we just have a Kindle. So. Yeah, sorry. Not quite as, as exciting as the real thing. But uh, where are you in your Kubernetes journey? Looks like vast majority of you are using it in production. That makes sense. I guess if you're here for a FinOps conversation, it's probably at a point where you're either nervous about using it because you're afraid you can't manage the cost or you're using it in production and you already know you can't or you have a difficult time doing this. Kubernetes is very easy to lose the thread on what you're doing with costs, so it makes sense. Um, and this is about the breakdown that we've tended to see most recently. So appreciate that. You can pull off those results. Great. And let's go ahead and dive into our topic today, starting with what is FinOps. So uh, we've pulled from the FinOps Foundation, the textbook definition, and I'm going to read this and then we're going to discuss it briefly. But FinOps is an evolving cloud financial management discipline and cultural practice that enables organizations to get maximum business value by helping engineering, finance, technology, and business teams to collaborate on data-driven spending decisions. Holy cow, that's a mouthful, uh, but let's, uh, let's unpack that. Um, Robert, why does it matter that the entire organization understands cost? Yeah, so I like to think of FinOps as like a, a natural extension of DevOps, right? Uh, at some point in the last decade or so, this idea of DevOps became a thing where you take development and operations and you really get them working well together. Um, in the bad old days, there was uh, too much of a wall between those two roles and it caused a lot of friction and a lot of problems for the business. So we're seeing the same thing now between finance and operations, right? Um, the decisions that the operations team makes on a day-to-day -day basis, which are often driven by engineering needs and engineering desires, um, often, uh, you know, finance takes a back seat there and isn't consulted on decisions that might actually impact the bottom line, impact uh, cost of goods, things like that. Uh, so making sure that finance and operations are working together is, is super important to make sure that, you know, you're making decisions uh, with the whole business in mind rather than, you know, decisions that just um, think about engineering and, and how engineering operates. Uh, finance needs to be looped into those decisions so that trade-offs can be discussed uh, between, you know, ramping up more infrastructure and speeding up your developers versus, you know, keeping those costs uh, at a reasonable level um, and, you know, potentially slowing engineering down. Yeah, that's, that's part of why this definition doesn't say FinOps is the one-time thing where you drop into an organization, save them a quarter of a million dollars and move on and never engage over again, right? This is a, uh, it's a discipline, it's a cultural practice that is ongoing um, and enables organizations to get business value. Like I, I, hate, I, I hate that it says business value, but it is the right word in that, uh, you know, what we need is for organizations to be spending the right amount of money giving finance confidence that that's what it's doing, giving engineering the budget to spend on other things so that it's not overspending, uh, et cetera. So having a practice organizationally of understanding where is your money going? Why is it going there? Is it going to the right places? If we cut some of this spend, are we cutting it in the right places, et cetera? That's all part of FinOps. And uh, before I move on, Rachel, anything to add to that? No, I don't think I could have said it better. You know, that was such a good description. I think um, one of the challenges is so often, you know, cloud spend just increases and it's hard to tie those things back to what exactly the business value is or what the goal you're trying to do is. And so, yeah, I think it's just kind of that holistic view of trying to see how do we how do we tie this all back together to what we're trying to achieve? Yeah, great. So um, why, why do we care about that? And uh, I mean, it, it, it may seem obvious and I, you know, we've, we've already all touched just a tiny bit on this, but um, why does what we're spending matching what we want to be spending matter? Uh, and Rachel, do you want to start with that one? Sure. Um, yes, yeah, so I've worked at a number of organizations where we have seen cloud costs increase and there's always somebody that asks, you know, what are we actually spending this on or how do we connect this back to things? And usually the first thing is, I don't know, you know, it, it, we have this big idea of like how it should tie back, but pinpointing it down to certain things is a lot trickier. And so if we don't start to take a closer look at those things, that's when things do kind of snowball out of control. And 
it's really important to be able to focus on you know how we are spinning up new resources and compute and stuff and storage and figuring out how that impacts different portions of the business and just trying to really focus on you know how all that ties to the bigger picture robert anything to add to that um yeah so i'll, I'll say you know maybe if you're if you're you know a small startup that just raised 10 million dollars in funding and you've only got two users and you know your crowd bills are still pretty small maybe you don't care um, but the second your, your organization gets to be a certain size, you know, you've got a bunch of users, you've got, um, you know, cloud costs that are, that are substantial, you know, maybe tens of thousands of dollars a month. You know, some companies spend billions of dollars per month, uh, on Amazon and, and Google, uh, GCP and all that. Um, so once you hit a certain, a certain point in the size of your business, it becomes critical that you understand where all these costs are coming from. Uh, and very frequently, you will see businesses that once they start to put some tooling in place to understand where are these costs coming from, they realize they've got, you know, whole machines that are running that nobody's using. Like there's just a ton of waste in there. Um, and that not only, you know, is money that that's kind of just going out the door, it can really affect your company's balance sheet too, right? It can look like uh, your product costs a lot more to deliver than it actually does. Um, and that can affect how much investment you're able to get, et cetera. So it can really have a, a huge impact on the business if you're uh, if you're not you know, putting some, uh, you know, instrumentation in place to understand, you know, what you're spending and why you're spending it. And I, and I want to add the other side of that, which is there are some organizations that become so cost sensitive that it becomes 100% about cutting costs, cutting costs, the minimum possible, the minimum possible. And there is a world wherein you can under provision all of your things and it's technically working. It's just a terrible experience for everyone. And so, you know, if you don't have visibility into what the right amounts are of the right things, you can be giving all of your users a terrible experience and reporting up to finance. Hey, it only costs us this much to run everything when actually it costs you this much to run it well. And, uh, you know, even knowing that is another important thing. So um, while most of FinOps conversation is around the saving money side, it's not just saving money. And uh, we have a slide here that, that says that it's not just cost savings. Uh, that's not all FinOps is. And, and this, is a, this is a slide that I insisted we put in. And it was at least one person at Fairwinds that was like, I hate that meme style of the, 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 the clapping between every word. But like, it really is like, it's not just cost savings. Uh, cost savings is a part of what you're doing in FinOps and making sure that you're saving money in the right places is a significant part of uh, all things related to FinOps. But if all you're doing is cutting costs, you're going to run into other problems. And um, really what you want is tooling and you want a practice that enables both increase and decrease where you can, because there are times where you do need to spend more money than you're spending in the same way that like i mean this applies to everything right you 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 go hire the uh the very junior person and they're not solving your problem it seems like you're spending less but you're not it's costing you more uh you know that you you drive the uh 2004 subaru with flames on the side and uh, uh a racing stripe down the front which i may or may not have recently owned uh it ends up costing you more than you think it costs you because it just just does not work you can't sell it for anything and it ends up eventually you know with the mechanic telling you please never put this on the road again it shouldn't be legal and uh you know it can cost you there are costs in just cutting corners um before i move on from that anything to add yeah um that's a great point. One thing that we've had happen a number of times is we've used tooling to work with our clients and actually show them ways where if they spend more money, their infrastructure will be more reliable. So maybe they have an API running in Kubernetes and they don't have enough, you know, backups. So there's not enough, the deployment doesn't have enough pods running. And we would recommend, you know, if this is critical to you, you really should have more. Maybe you should allocate more CPU and memory because you don't want it to get own killed and just be a bad experience for your users. And so those are situations where having FinOps in mind and using tooling, spending more money is actually the right thing to do if that meets your business needs. Yeah, I think that's, that's a really great point. Uh, and being able to quantify those decisions, you know, if we uh, you know, double the number of pods running this application, or if we, you know, add one CPU to every single pod, like this is what it's going to cost us. And, uh, you know, this is what the impact users is going to be. 
uh, are really great, uh, you know, ways to go to your finance department or, you know, the head of the operations department and say, you know, here's a here's a decision I think we should make. Here's what it's going to cost us. Here's how it's going to benefit our users. The right tooling can uh, allow you to answer those those questions really easily. Yeah, that's 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 a key point. It's one thing to be constantly telling your leadership, we have to spend more. Things are bad. We have to spend more. Things are bad. But unless you can say, OK, we have to spend more. This is how much more we have to spend for things to be better. Uh, you know, it's it's really hard for for finance to make those decisions. I have seen. Um, well, a good friend of mine was an infrastructure leader at a very large publicly traded company, grew it and grew it and grew it and grew it and said, hey, we have to get our cost under control. And leadership kept telling him, it doesn't matter, just spend. It doesn't matter, just spend. It doesn't matter, just spend. And uh, eventually it got to a point where it mattered and they fired him. And he was like, what the heck? I literally said this constantly. Um, so it's a thing that happens and uh, it's, you know, it can cost you uh your job in addition to just uh, uh, infrastructure that's provisioned correctly. So um, the CNCF recently did a FinOps survey and um, I guess this was a year ago, but it says among those whose spend increased, whose cloud spend increased, half of companies saw it jump more than 20% during the year. So it's common for organizations to see things go up and lose track of how much it's going up. And, you know, a 20% increase, I mean, you, you, you can imagine if you're talking about a uh, million dollars, that's a, that's a whole hire. Um, if you're, that, that, that all of a sudden is gone, right? Like there's a whole person you could have hired or, or maybe many, many people, depending on how much uh, you're, you're paying for engineers these days um, and where they are, I guess. But, uh, you know, if, and if it's tens of million dollars, it's a whole lot more. And even if it's just little things like, hey, we also need the budget to buy X, Y, or Z. Um, it's really easy to have costs run away in a hurry. Um, do you, I mean, I know we've seen organizations that are wildly over-provisioned. Uh, do we have any any stories that y'all can share um, without customer names about uh, wild over-provisioning? Yeah, I do remember one that was running. Um, it was some development workload. You know, it wasn't customer facing at all. Uh, it might have been like GitLab, a CI/CD runners, or something like that. Uh, and we could tell from the instrumentation instrumentation that we put in place that they had asked for, you know, say two CPUs per uh, per pod on these workloads. Uh, and there were tons of them because it was like every CI CD process or something like that. So these things were constantly running, uh, you know, using, you know, dozens of CPUs every single hour or something like that. Uh, and they were only using like, you know, 1% of what they were asking for. And so we were able to turn that down and save them thousands of dollars per month uh, just from that one, that one workload. Uh, and again, with zero impact to customers. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think a common pattern that often happens is, you know, developers, they work with infrastructure, but to a certain degree. And so if they do get something working, they'll talk with another developer and be like, here's the Kubernetes manifest that I use to get it working. I've had no problems. And suddenly it just gets copied from developer to developer. Now everybody has, you know, eight gigabytes of memory and four CPU cores or whatever they might need, you know, that got it working that particular time. And with this move to Kubernetes in the cloud, you know, we have this wonderful ability to auto scale when we need it. And if we are requesting for CPUs, but using 1%, like Robert said, Kubernetes is going to be like, I need to give them at least four CPUs. And so that's going to scale out horizontally pretty fast. And next thing you know, you have way more nodes than you ever anticipated based on, you know, not right sizing your workloads and having efficiencies quite right. So it was easy for that to run away. Yeah. Okay. So um, the FinOps Foundation says the number one problem is getting engineers to take action on the problem. And part of the reason this is difficult is uh, in any sufficiently large organization or any organization that has actually put in place some kind of service ownership, service ownership being where you've pushed the ownership of a service from, you know, from development all the way through to production down to the developer's responsibility or the, the people who build it need to own it all the way through production, need to own responding to incidences, et cetera. If you have a sufficiently large organization, uh, you need your engineers to care about this. You need them to be involved in it every step of the way. And most engineers, 
don't know how to care about it. They're not DevOps engineers. They don't know what it takes to provision. You know, it's, it's very easy for an engineer to say, well, it works on my machine. And then they go to the Apple in the top corner of their Mac and they say about this machine and they look at, you know, how much CPU and how, how much RAM do I have? Okay, I guess I'll just provision that, right? Like, I mean, it's, it's, it's not that crazy out of, uh, out of the ordinary to think because it's just not, not a world they've had to live in. So how do we make that, uh, how do we get engineers to take action? Um, Robert, you want to talk about that? Yeah, I mean, so this is the whole problem of shift left, right? Um, there are people who are well downstream from the engineers, people working in operations, people working in finance, uh, who are responsible for these decisions getting made by engineers, right? Uh, if an engineer provisions, you know, a workload with 16 CPUs or whatever, then, uh, you know, finance is going to find out, you know, a month later, and they need to feed that, that fact back to the engineers and get the en engineers to change their configuration. Um, and so more and more, you're seeing this idea of shifting that, shifting that information left uh, so that as an engineer, say, makes a pull request, they're getting that information fed back to them very quickly. Like, hey, you're asking for way too many CPUs, uh, you know, you're trying to do things you shouldn't do. Um, so that way, before the code even gets checked into production or checked into the main branch of the repo, let alone gets into the, the Kubernetes cluster, your actual production environment, the engineer is getting that feedback and can make those changes, you know, while they're already there, rather than having this month long feedback loop where, you know, you have to involve other people in finance operations, things like that. Yeah, I think of it a little bit as um, I have four children. And taking care of four children constantly is complicated, especially as they get older and have more complicated social lives. Uh, for years, we have been able to send a kid to go play somewhere, right, with some kind of boundaries around it. Yeah, you can go play as long as you're home by 4.30, 5, right? Uh, the problem is they don't have a watch because they lose their watches all the time. And so we just, we have a, a rule in the house. Like you, you don't get to play with your friends unless you have a watch. And like, we make them buy the watch when, uh, whenever they lose a watch because it's a constant thing. Uh, but um, you know, if I give my son a watch, he can set an alarm. Hey, at three 15, I got to leave because I got to be home by three 30 and it. And we can make my kids successful with the right tooling. And, uh, you know, it's the it's, it's same thing with your engineers. It's not that they want to screw everything up. They want to do it right. They just probably don't know how. And so having tooling in place that's going to help your engineers own this problem is a big part of the reason uh, or is a big part of what it takes to get them to do it. And a lot of engineers can't take action because uh, they're not enabled to do so. So the whole point of this is why is FinOps different in Kubernetes? Let's talk for a minute about that. Um, what's different about Kubernetes, Robert? Why is this a bigger black box than previous things? Yeah, so uh, before Kubernetes, uh, what you would typically do is if you want to launch a new application, you would provision one or more EC2 instances in your Amazon account uh, and deploy uh, directly to each of those instances. And then when you get your AWS bill, you can see, okay, this instance cost me this much money. It was used by this application. Therefore, this application cost me X dollars per month. There's a very one-to-one -one mapping between applications and items on your AWS bill. What's different in Kubernetes is that now you have a bunch of EC2 instances that basically become a pool of memory and CPU that any application can pull from. And so you might have three or four different applications all running on the same you know, actual uh, you know, EC2 instance that's on your Amazon bill. And so the question becomes, you know, when you get that bill from AWS, how do you take that one instance and divide it among all the applications that may or may not have been using it at the time? Uh, so it becomes this weird, uh, you know, black hole in terms of what AWS can see uh, without being able to look inside the cluster and see which applications happen to be running on this app, on this node at this time. Uh, there's no way to really split up that AWS bill fairly between applications. Yep. Yeah. The, the, the world of, um, Owning your infrastructure has changed and owning your infrastructure to cloud was as big, like having your own data center and moving to cloud was as big of a shift in some ways as going from cloud and directly talking to, you know, Amazon APIs as it is uh, going from that to Kubernetes. And it's just a whole different world. You're defining things in a different way and Kubernetes can run with it in a different way. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a little like telling, uh, a young child, here's how big the boat is, put as many containers on it as you can, and this is what 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 can happen. Um, I mean, this is probably actually loaded by a 
significant professional uh, or group of professionals, but, uh, uh, you know, run away, whatever is real easy to happen because it's just a, a, that, that everything about it's different. Um, okay. So talk, talk a little bit more about, uh, you know, shared resources, uh, the, the, the fact that everything can just auto scale on its own. I mean, Rachel, talk about this. Uh, what's, why is this so different? Yeah, I think, um, you know, Robert was touching on it and how, you know, now that we have this pool of resources, we've essentially used a Kubernetes cluster to turn it into one platform to just deploy things. And so if Amazon or Google or Azure is charging us maybe by the minute, maybe by the hour at some rate like that, and we have a team that is deploying something into a Kubernetes cluster, what if they only run their resource for 36 minutes a day? How would you charge them for that? You know, is it on one node? Is it on two nodes? Is it on the more expensive nodes? Or is it on the cheaper nodes? There's just so many different things to keep track of. And even if you plan for some of those things, what if it requires, you know, what if customers are hitting it faster and it auto scales out horizontally and now it's just completely changed the calculation? Certainly a lot of people, you know, in the past few years have been like, well, maybe I can just label things and I can script them. But there are all sorts of complications for that, because then how do you think about the unused resources? You know, Kubernetes is all about optimizing that. So we're not using more than we need. And there's just so many different problems to think through that make it really challenging to, to figure out how to allocate things to teams. You know, maybe if you're at a huge organization, you can just do a cluster for a team, but that is probably not practical for the vast majority of people. And maybe you could cut it up by namespace, but that's still not solving the underlying node and cost problem at all. So there's just so many things to think through with the shift Kubernetes and how you allocate cost. Let, I want to ask about that, like, um, you know, Kubernetes has a horizontal pod autoscaler. I, I set some things and I let it scale, right? Like, I suppose I could set them wrong, which is part of what we're talking about. A lot of people do set it wrong, right? Uh, there's also a vertical pod autoscaler. Um, can't I just turn on vertical pod autoscaling and horizontal pod autoscaling and hand it to Kubernetes and everything's going to be just great and fine and dandy? My first reaction to that is you definitely don't want to use both of them together. Uh, <laughs> um, so that Why not? I mean, talk about why not. So they're really in conflict with each other, right? If you're if you have a workload that um, starts getting increased load, uh, starts using more CPU and memory and stuff like that, um, the question is should it scale should it scale vertically? Like you know should I should I allocate more CPU and memory to that single pod, single instance of it, or should I scale it horizontally uh, and just come up with more instances of it that can spread traffic across across uh, all all the instances? Um, and that's kind of a, a design decision that you need to make. You know how well does your application parallelize, um, you know, how much, uh, you know, efficiency do you gain by having it all running in the same process, that sort of thing. Um, so that's really a decision that you, you need to be thinking about in terms of how your own application behaves. Um, you also need to provide some limits for that too, right? If you have a memory leak, you don't want the vertical pod autoscaler to just keep provisioning more and more and more and more memory, or you're going to eat up an entire node uh, before your application crashes. You want to tell Kubernetes, this is the maximum amount of memory that my application will use under normal circumstances. If it tries to use more, use more than that, kill it and start up a new one. Um, and then you know, you know you've got some kind of memory issue, but it's not going to hog your resources in the, in the meantime. Um, so there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of limits you should put in place, a lot of um, you know, hints you kind of need to give to Kubernetes about what a normal, normal behavior for your application looks like uh, for, it to, for Kubernetes to be able to do its job in terms of autoscaling. But Robert, if I've just hacked your infrastructure and I'm planning on doing some uh, crypto mining uh, in the background without you noticing, won't all of these protections in place that you're talking about cause me problems? Uh, exactly. <laughs> which, yeah, exactly. That's exactly the point, right? Yeah, there's, there's, and it's not just a bad actor. I mean, most, the vast majority of the time, the problems come from uh, uh, incompetence, not maliciousness. And uh, it's easy to be incompetent unless you, you have the right, uh, bits there. Okay. What am, what am I not talking about on, on the storage side? Is there a way to run, um, you know, stateful sets or storage workloads within Kubernetes that, that get complicated? Is that difficult to track? Like what, what, what have we not covered? Yeah. Storage is definitely a tricky one in Kubernetes. We're seeing it more and more. Folks are try starting to tackle this idea of trying to run stateful things inside of Kubernetes. Um, but it's uh, it's still not something I personally would recommend just because of the, the scariness of data loss. 
Um, but it does add to the uh, complexity of billing, right? Storage does cost you money. You probably want to see that, you know, listed out in any kind of bill for an application. Yeah. Um, okay. Have we, have we, have we beat this sufficiently? Anything that we're leaving out here, uh, Rachel? I think so. Yeah, I think we're good. It's a hard challenge to solve without the right tooling. So, uh, I, I guess one, one last question. Do we talk about spot instances specifically? How does spot instances affect, uh, you know, FinOps and Kubernetes in particular? I think it, you know, just further complicates this problem because again, you, you know, if you have a reserved instance, you have a very fixed rate and you know what you're paying, but if you have a spot instance for five hours and maybe three of your nine teams use it, it's just like we're adding more variables to this calculation, which is just making it even harder to calculate. And yeah, it just makes it that much harder to figure everything out without the right tooling. And yeah. So, so I, I to put a, to put a, cap on this um i mean back in the day when you went and bought you know a rack worth of computers you knew what that rack of computers cost you to set up you knew what your internet bill was and that was what it cost you to run your application and it was never more or never less unless you shut off a machine or uh, power went down or something else um, or you had to replace a computer, but it was a very fixed set. You knew what that set was. You knew what it was going to cost you. Move to the cloud, and there used to be some controllability when it was just EC2, and you're using something like Ansible, and you're choosing, okay, we need to add a couple instances or reduce a couple instances. You have a pretty good idea of what an instance costs. But in Kubernetes, it's very easy to hand over a set of instructions to Kube let it run wild and lose track real quick of what things look like. It's real easy to have wild over provisioning. It's real easy to let Kubernetes bin pack inappropriately, uh, you know, over too much or too little, you know, all the way around and start to cause problems. So the reason FinOps is different in Kubernetes is it's a whole new paradigm. We're literally just declaring the beauty of Kubernetes is we just declare what we want and Kubernetes goes and makes it. So the problem is, uh, Without some clear directions to Kubernetes, um, it can mess all of that up. It's a, it's a child without a watch going over to his friend's house and uh, completely clueless to the world. So um, it's real easy to let it run wild. So uh, let's talk. Yeah, we've. I think we've covered service ownership significantly. Is there anything else to add to this? Like we, we talked, well, maybe not significantly. At the beginning, we talked a little bit about developers owning this. So what does it take for a developer to own this, particularly in Kubernetes world? How do I, as a developer writing code, do something other than click on my Apple button and say, uh, you know, this is how much memory and CPU I need because it works on my, you know, the joke with Docker is, uh, it works on my machine became, okay, let's ship your machine. And, um, you know, it's real easy to do that, right? How do, we, how do we do something better in service ownership? I think the big thing is just making sure that information is being fed back to development teams. Um, so they should understand, you know, how much does their uh, application cost as it runs in production? You know, what are the compute costs that it's incurring? Um, you know, what are the storage costs that it's incurring, et cetera? Um, and then also making sure, you know, once once at least those those raw costs are being fed back to them, so they know, you know, if if costs increase by twenty percent this month or something like that, they can start to think, okay, what might we have done? What might we have shipped that caused that cost increase? It's a great starting point. Um, on top of that, it's really helpful to uh, get some metrics around, like, okay, how efficient are they being? Like, is there a bunch of CPU that they provisioned that's going unused? Um, is there a bunch of memory that they provisioned that's going unused? Things like that. Um, so you can kind of start to feed back to them. Okay. Uh, you know, you're costing $10,000 a month. You're really only using like $3,000 worth of that. Uh, so like, is there something you could be doing? Is there something you could be tuning better to start saving that money? Yeah. Yeah. I think to add to that, um, you know, trying to get that information into the feedback loop with the, you know, the owners that are putting that out, I think is the most helpful. That way, if they see this having an impact and they can do something about it without even having to do the extra work to like look for it, I think that's going to make a lot bigger impact. Um, and yeah, Robert talked about, you know, shifting left, which is certainly challenging in a lot of ways without the right information, but that's kind of just getting it into that workflow. So it's right there where you would expect to see it. And it just makes it a lot easier. Yeah. Okay, great. So uh, a couple of things that I want to mention on this. First of all, Fairwinds, as I mentioned, makes a lot of software to give you confidence that you're using Kubernetes right. Uh, if 
you know, we're, we're about to show our SaaS platform that addresses this uh, significantly from a FinOps perspective. Um, however, uh, you know, if you want to take a look at some of our open source, we have a project out there that plays in this space. It's called Goldilocks. It gets your workload requests and limits just right. That's why it's called Goldilocks. Um, and, uh, you know, go, go check that out. It's easy to install it on one cluster, check out a couple of workloads, see how things are going. If you want to operationalize it at a larger scale, that's where our SaaS software comes in and, and really offers a number of advantages in addition to that. Um, but those, those are, that's a good place to get started. Um, and that's just, you know, github.com slash fairwinds ops is our, our open source repos. Um, so that's something worth going and checking out, but let's dive into fairwinds insights, uh, which is software for governance and guardrails from CI CD through to production. And, um, just at a high level, I'm going to, I'm going to show it to you in just a second, but as I've mentioned several times, this is a new paradigm in Kubernetes. And for a bunch of clusters and a bunch of teams, managing Kubernetes and containers is hard. And uh, it's hard for organizations to know if they have security lockdown in Kubernetes. There's different security considerations than there are in other things. It's hard for organizations to know if uh, they have the right policy and guardrails so their people aren't deploying the wrong things in the wrong places. And it's really difficult for uh, engineers in particular to own the cost optimization of their workloads, let alone operations teams um, inside of Kubernetes because it is just different. So let's pull up Fairwind's Insights and let's walk you through what some of this looks like. So when you log into Fairwind's Insights, we're going to give you a dashboard that shows you across the organization, a bunch of clusters and how well they're doing. So we give you a health score across the organization uh, there's a bunch of clusters running. We all have about the same health score here, it looks like. And um, I can click into any one of these organizations or any one of these clusters. I'm going to click on Proxima Prod, and it's going to bring up this dashboard that's specific to this cluster. Now I see a list of action items being introduced to the cluster on the top of the line and being removed from the cluster on the bottom of the line. Um, we uh, track a bunch of action items. So I'll show you what, what kinds of action items we get, but we're prioritizing them for you because having a list of 2,807 things that you need to do, uh, that's that's the ones that are passing, or you know, even a couple of hundred that uh, need being addressed is really overwhelming for ops teams. And so knowing what's critical, what do I need to go address right now is something that we prioritize uh, nailing down for you. We track that health score over time. We also have some cost management here, which is what we're here to talk about primarily today. I'm gonna to give you a high level overview of the whole platform, but I'll spend some time on that uh, cost management bit. Um, so where is this coming from? Uh, we have a big list of action items and this is, I guess I'll show you where it's coming from in a second, but uh, you know, in just one cluster, uh, I can see all of the issues that are that are popping up. So um, the critical issues here are the issues that we need to go take care of right away. I can click on this and find out there are known CVEs running in my cluster. So this is things like um, when the uh, log4j problem came out recently, that was a CVE that was reported. If you have that running somewhere in your cluster, this is the kind of tool that's going to alert you to that and say, hey, we know that there's things wrong uh, running in this container. You need to update them because there's a vulnerability here. Um, it's written in such a way that you don't have to be a very senior Kubernetes engineer to know how to go about solving the problem. And uh, let's see, I, I did this a different way than I normally do. So I'm gonna go back to my dashboard here. Let's see, clusters. I want to show you where this, where all these reports are coming from. So in uh, here we have an install hub where we can see all the different projects that are installed. So Polaris is a open source tool that Fairwinds has built that identifies common Kubernetes misconfigurations. This is one of our earliest projects in the space, just seeing that lots of people make the same mistakes over and over again. So we wrote a software tool to address that. You can write custom policy in Polaris take the checks out of the box in Polaris and you're gonna be a lot closer to avoiding common mistakes. Um, we also have Nova, which checks for out-of-date Helm charts or Pluto checking for deprecated APIs. But we've also married together a bunch of other open source. So Trivi, KubeBench, we have KubeSec, we have support for Open Policy Agent, um, and we also run uh, Goldilocks underneath the hood for some of our cost efficiency bits here. So um, this is where all these reports are coming from. 
Now, if you saw that big long action item list and you're overwhelmed, I get it. As a uh, ops engineer, the last thing you need is a gigantic list of all the things you're doing wrong. You know there's some things wrong in your environment. So you wanna be able to stop that beforehand. So when we talk about guardrails, that's what we're talking about, how you can write policy once and have it implemented everywhere, including uh, CI at the admission controller level and uh, at runtime in the, in the cluster. So here we have an engineer who's pushing um, some, some new code into a cluster and you can see CircleCI is failing it, but also Fairwind's Insights is failing it. And so in a workflow that an engineer already understands working within something like GitHub, and it doesn't have to be specific to GitHub, you can do this lots of different places. Um, you can just click details, it'll load you into the UI, show the engineer, hey, there's five action items, two are critical, you have to address these two critical items before you'll be able to deploy. And then things are going to improve over time because you as a uh, platform engineer or whatever your title is, have set the guardrails that your organization needs to meet and your engineers are going to not be able to deploy things into the cluster without meeting those uh, standards. And they're not going to have to come to you with every single question for what's the problem, how do I fix it, because we're going to expose that for you um, through Fairwinds Insights. So uh, that's kind of a high level of what a bunch of the different things are. There's way more here, including uh, you know the ability to compare clusters, to write custom policy um, and to automate things like kicking something out to a JIRA ticket in an automated way. There's a lot of ways to plug this in across your organization, make your, make your team successful, integrations with Datadog, Slack, et cetera. But let's look at the efficiency tab because this is where our cost and FinOps bits come into play. And this is what we're talking about today. So here across my organization, I get an overview of my clusters, what they're costing me. Um, and, uh, it's, it's a quick glance at available CPU, total CPUs, et cetera, uh, across my clusters. And uh, you can do this across a 30-day average or um, something else. And uh, we track that cost over time as a demo environment. So it's a little bit of a, a boring cost graph here, I guess. But um, we track that utilization as well. And then I can actually go into the workload level and, again, select a specific cluster and see some fine grain details about that cluster. So the daily cost, um, what each workload is costing me relatively across the cluster. And I'm gonna go in here and look at the recommendations that we're giving. So in certain situations, uh, Fairwinds Insights is going to suggest that you spend more money. And you can see that here in a couple situations where we're saying, hey, you're um, under provisioned. If you can set the quality of service that you require. So if this is a guaranteed level that we need, we're going to suggest that you increase those resource requests and limits. If it's limited, if it's burstable, whatever, I mean, it's it's not always we're going to suggest that I'm saying in this particular situation, we think it's under provisioned given the quality of service level that you're looking for. And if you change that, it'll go down. But here, um, you know, we see a workload that uh, we've marked as critical. And um, we think it's still over provision. So we're telling you to spend a little bit less. You can click on that workload, get loaded into this, where we're going to show you this is the limit you currently have. This is the requests uh, that you're making today. We think you should set your requests and limits over here um, at, a different, at a different level. So down, if I can scroll, why is my computer all of a sudden not scrolling? There we go. Um, so the average cost for this particular workload is $9.57. With our recommendations, it's only going to be $8.66. It's probably not worth making a bunch of changes across your organization in order to save you less than a dollar. Uh, however, at any kind of significant scale, this demo environment becomes uh, you know, much more meaningful. And you can sort uh, across the organization um, a number of different ways to see, you know, what's what's the total cost, or you can sort by the cost with recommendations and see where you can save different save save money significantly. So, yeah, here uh, the cost difference with recommendations. So here's the workload that we're going to save the most on. You can sort right that way. Um, there's a lot more here in Fairwinds Insights. This is just the beginning of showing you how this works. Um, but uh, if you're interested in knowing more, you're welcome to reach out to us. We'll have someone that can walk through it more specifically for you. And uh, we have a question that came in and we'll get to that in just a second here. I just did the demo, but let's wrap up with a uh, poll here before I get to the Q&A section and then um, we'll go from there. So what's the greatest opportunity to improve your Kubernetes environment? 
Uh, is it all about saving money for you? Or are you still just looking help, looking for help with getting started? Um, best practices across what you're doing currently, improving the reliability of your apps or working on the security posture of your clusters. So if you take a second and fill that out. Do, 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 do. See, Rachel, this time you're supposed to sing. Do, do, do. Still need to work on my interpretive dance skills. I keep telling my daughters it's time for them to sit down and do this with me, but uh, we never get around to it. Um, we'll give that just a second more. Click a button. Tell us uh, your greatest opportunity to improve your Kube environment. So we have a feeling for that. This is metrics that we collect over time to see where people are with their Kubernetes situation. So yeah, saving money is the biggest one. Makes sense. You're attending this particular webinar. But yep, security and saving money. This tends to be where we see a lot of people struggling. So uh, if you're wrestling with either of these, this is a place that Fairwinds plays. Reach out to us. We'd be happy to have a conversation with you. Our software literally exists to solve these problems. Uh, and uh, let's wrap that up and jump into some Q&A. So we do have a question that came through. If others have questions, please type them in that Q&A tab um, and we'll get to those. Okay, uh, Robert, Rachel, you ready for this? Many companies think it's okay to spend extra money on the Kubernetes clusters running in production. Uh, running production workloads. Similarly, teams need to replicate similar infrastructure on integration or pre-prod side to ensure the deployment would scale and perform the same way as in prod before reaching prod. To me, it's a lot of money spent on a pre-prod environment. What are your thoughts on that? And how do you prevent making pre-prod environment as big of a black hole? Thanks. Yeah, it's a really interesting question. Um... You know, we've done some of that, you know, type of pre-prod load testing ourselves. Uh, we typically don't do it for like every single pull request or every single release. Um, we just run it on uh, a cadence. Um, so maybe every month or every quarter just to make sure that any, uh, any you know, big changes there are expected. Um, and that's, that's typically a much um, a smaller bill right rather than having a perpetual staging environment that has you know prod level traffic we just have um you know we'll, we'll temporarily spin something up for a few hours load test it spin it back down uh, and that that really contains the cost um hopefully that that started to answer your question do you have anything to add rachel no i think that's a great point just yeah how much what's your risk to reward i guess tolerance for how much load do you want to put it under and yeah, I think the thing to keep in mind is go ahead, Robert. Keep in mind is that there's no there's no way to perfectly emulate production, right? You can you can fire a bunch of load at a staging environment just to see how it'll behave, um, but there's no way to just remove all the uncertainty of how things are going to scale in prod, how things are going to behave in prod. Um, you can get closer and closer to that uh, by spending more and more money, more and more effort on that testing, um, but it's uh, it's always an imperfect science. There's, there's a reason that there are organizations out there that have made their names with logos or uh, slogans like I test and prod, right? Uh, because, it, it, you know, that's being a little bit facetious or hand wavy. Obviously, you test before prod, but some things just can't be tested outside, you know, like you're, you're, you're actually, you're always testing in prod, right? Anytime you're sending something into production, you're finding out, does it work in prod? And uh, does it work at the scale? And does it work the way I think it works? Because you can test the heck out of it beforehand. And um, I mean, I would say one of the biggest differences here is what you're probably not doing in your pre-production environments is running it at the same size and scale as your production environment all the time. Like you might even spin it up to that big to see if it can work. Uh, I'm not sure that that's even super common. You, you know, you're probably kicking the tires on individual services in certain ways, but uh, there's, there is a world wherein you spin up your pre-prod environments to be as big as production just to make sure everything's working, but you're not going to leave that on at that capacity and size all the time. And part of the beauty of Kubernetes is you can just scale it all down. Uh, so one of the ways to prevent your pre-production environment from becoming a, a black hole as much as production is install Fairwinds Insights on it. it costs you, you know, it doesn't cost you much more to have it running in your 
dev environments, right? Uh, but uh, have something that gives you an overview of all your clusters. And in theory, you're going to see that your pre-production environments are costing you less. Uh, and you want to know that. Um, there's definitely times where we see development environments that are widely, wildly, wildly over-provisioned. We have had organizations, uh, we had an organization save a quarter of a million dollars in a brief uh, proof of concept with us. We've had organizations tell us they believe they're 900% they're over provisioned. Uh, you know, in Robert's example, they were only using 1% of what they had provisioned. So there's always, um, yeah, anyways, there's always ways to do this better and good tooling is going to make it obvious and easy for you. So. Um, are there any more questions? Let's see if somebody's said anything elsewhere. Yeah, Dave's sharing a link to the cost optimization white paper. I have that pulled up on the slide right there. If you want to go check out cost optimization in Kubernetes, we have a guide for that. Uh, it talks about everything from why it's hard to getting applications right-sized and... Um, I'm sure that it also talks about our software. Look, there's a million ways to try to do this the right way. Call us, have a demo with us. We're probably gonna save you enough money in the demo to make the time you spent on the phone worthwhile. And uh, unless you have just like very, very little cloud spend, but if you're using Kubernetes at any size and scale, we're probably gonna be a significant help. And um, with that, I will wrap up and hand things back over to you, Cody. Thanks so much. Thank you, Kendall. And I'd also like to thank Robert and Rachel for joining us today, as well as Dave for adding in those um, that final link in the chat. So if you haven't had a chance to click on that white paper link, go ahead and do that while it's there. Um, so I'd like to remind everyone that today's session was recorded. So following this panel, you'll receive an email with a link to access that recording on demand, or you can find the recording living on the DevOps website at devops.com slash webinars, and just be sure to look in the on demand section. So onto those, the drawing for four $25 Amazon gift cards. Our first winner is Edith B. Our second winner is Zhao V. Our third winner, Lior Y. And our fourth and final winner is Raphael A. So to our four winners, congratulations. Please keep an eye on your inbox to claim that gift card. But if you do not see that email, just check your spam folder. I would like to thank Fairwinds for sponsoring today's webinar. And of course, before we close, I'd like to thank you, our audience. We really appreciate you spending time with us this afternoon. Uh, we ask for just one extra moment of your time to fill out a brief post-webinar survey that'll pop up on your screen here in just a moment. But otherwise, we do hope to see you all at an upcoming Tech Strong Learning program. Everyone have a great rest of your day. And Kendall, Robert, Rachel, thank you again. <laughs>